Hello, everyone, and welcome to week seven of Mass Communication 100. This video will go over part one of chapter nine, which will focus on the history of the magazine industry. So magazines have changed a lot from their first use. Uh, and one of the ways that you can see how widely uh, things have changed is by looking at a single magazine that has been around since 1886, and that's Cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan was started in the 1800s. It was a monthly magazine for the modern family. So it showcased things like cooking, childcare, household decor, you know, all modern things. In 1889, uh, John Walker actually purchased the Cosmopolitan magazine and turned it into a literary magazine, which was popular at the time. Uh, Cosmopolitan would feature famous writers and serialize entire books. So instead of getting one publication of the entire book, you'd get like a chapter at a time. This is actually how H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds was published. 1905, uh, Cosmopolitan was sold to Hearst and it became a muckraking magazine focused on investigative journalism, uh, political issues, and social issues, and, and really trying to point those out to the public. Now in 1912, it moved to a monthly illustrated magazine for women, and it included short stories. But it wasn't until 1965 that Cosmopolitan started looking like we know it now. Uh, Helen Gurley Brown purchased it, or became the editor rather, um, and turned it into the Cosmo Girl, who was fun, fearless female. Um, and it really changed into a women's focused magazine at that time. Now today, Cosmopolitan is the top women's fashion magazine. It's published in over 80 countries. So we can see that from its original publication in 1886, Cosmopolitan has really gone through a lot of different evolutions that mirror the history of the industry overall. Now, magazines first began in France, and in fact, they were called magazines, uh, which is French for storehouse. If you speak French, please don't judge me. I'm sure I just butchered that. Uh, they were actually catalogs that were inserted into newspapers and primarily focused on things that you could purchase. Now, um, in London uh, in 1704, uh, Daniel Defoe became the editor of the first political magazine, which was Review, um, and it was a channel for political commentary and argument. The Review magazine actually looked like a newspaper, but it was printed less often, and instead of focusing on current events, it instead used analysis and commentary of larger social issues. Now, Tadler and Spectator appeared around the same time as Review. Uh, they used poetry, politics, and philosophy in their publications, and it was targeted towards London's elite, the upper class. And it was regularly published, uh, but only had a circulation of a few thousand people. The first magazine to actually use the word magazine instead of its French counterpart was Gentleman's Magazine in London in 1731. Gentleman's Magazine actually reprinted stories from newspapers, books, and political pamphlets, and it wasn't until later that they actually included original writing by prominent writers of the time, making it more of a literary magazine. Now, magazines in colonial America typically serve politicians, educated, and merchant classes. Uh, for 50 it was 50 years after the first colonial newspaper that the first colonial magazine was published. The first one was in 1741, American Magazine. Its editor was Andrew Bradford, and it only lasted three issues. Three days after uh, the publication of American Magazine, Ben Franklin uh, actually published General Magazine. His didn't last much longer, only six months, uh, but Ben Franklin lost out to that uh, being the first in history for the American Magazine just by three days. That would just kill you. Now, Independent Reflector and Pennsylvania Magazine were edited by Thomas Paine, and they were really key tools in the American Revolution to rally uh, colonists against British rule. In 1776, 100 magazines had already been uh, created and had already collapsed because they just weren't very popular and it, they were very difficult to produce in America for various reasons. 
Now, a lot of our founding fathers often wrote for magazines, and even Paul Revere worked as a magazine illustrator. So while they were an important part of culture, they weren't successful business-wise. It wasn't until specialty magazines that uh, magazines really saw their success in America. Specialization is the trend of reaching readers who share a particular uh, trait, such as a profession, a set of beliefs, or cultural taste, even demog demographic values such as uh, race, age, or gender. Now, one of the first specialty magazines in America uh, was Christian Journal and Advocate. In 1826, it had a circulation of 25,000, which was very large at the time. It was an overtly religious magazine, a Christian magazine, and boasted very large circulations because of the network of churches that were uh, distributing them. Literary magazines were also very popular um, in early America. North American Review, uh, included writers such as Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and Mark Twain. You may have heard of them. Um, and then there were specialty magazines that targeted specific professions, and those tended to be more popular than general uh, population magazines as well. Now, Saturday Evening Post was the first general interest magazine that was aimed at a national audience. It was created in 1821 in Philadelphia by Charles Alexander and Samuel Coat Atkinson. It was the longest running magazine in U.S. history, and it included essays and quote-unquote borrowed content from uh, famous writers of the time. Uh, it incorporated a lot of news, but also literary styles of poetry, essays, and play reviews. Some of the famous authors that were published in Saturday Evening Post were Nathaniel Hawthorne and Harriet Beecher Stowe. And it was one of the first major magazines to directly appeal to women with its lady friend column, uh, which talked about matters that would interest women. The market for magazines increased as literacy and public education increased in America. As faster printing technologies were developed and improvements in delivery service increased as well, there was more of a market for magazines. This is really why Amer American magazines were very slow to begin. We had problems being able to deliver magazines coast to coast. It was much more expensive to do so through the postal service than it was for a newspaper, which was lighter and cost less to ship. Um, and then it took a really long time to print magazines before the advent of some of the better press systems. And so um, by 1850, there were nearly 600 magazines that were published regularly thanks to this new interest um, based on literacy, public education, and developments in technology. Some of the most um, popular at the time were Graham's Magazine, which was very influential and entertaining. Knickerbar Knickerbocker was kind of a forerunner of the New Yorker and Harper's, uh, featuring a lot of uh, literary magazines uh, and, and writing. And Nation was uh, pioneered uh, through the political format, so it was one of the first successful political magazines. And then Youth Companion was one of the most successful magazines for younger readers. Women's magazines began in 1828. Uh, the first magazine that was designed exclusively for women was Ladies Magazine. Sarah Joseph Hale uh, was its publisher. And nine years after its original uh, publication, it merged with Godey's Ladies Book and uh, featured very popular color il illustrations. It was also very important for advocacy for women's rights in um, the mid-1800s. It had a circulation of 40,000, which was the biggest ever in the U.S. at the time, and it really showed that uh, women were a high market for mass media products. Godey's played a central role in educating women who had been denied access to higher education during the 19th century and really made a large um, impact on the women's movement in America. Illustrations began to be used in magazines in the 1850s. Um, because of the developments in the printing press, magazines had to use drawings, engravings, and woodcuts 
It really wasn't until the 1890s that magazines and newspapers could reproduce photos, making it difficult to illustrate magazines. In fact, Godes was using 150 women to color tint illustrations by hand during their magazine publications. Um, in 1850, Harper's New Monthly magazine used extensive woodcut illustrations and was known for including Civil War battlefield sketches. And uh, images and words really became critical in helping magazine become America's first mass medium. Now you can see uh, this gentleman here is a battlefield photographer. He was one of the very first photojournalists um, because he was reporting from uh, Civil War battle scenes and uh, was really known as one of the first photographers uh, or photojournalists rather um, in our country. His name is Matthew Brady. Now here are some of the illustrations that you can see from the magazines. They were very detailed drawings, um, but again, they were very difficult to mass produce. Here are some from uh, Godey's, so you can see the stylish fashion of the time. Now, modern magazines uh, really began developing after the Postal Act of 1879, which lowered postage rates for magazines. This put magazines on equal footing with newspapers for the first time. Magazines were especially expensive to send out through the Postal Service because they weighed so much, they were so heavy, that you would really have to pay a much higher fee to get a magazine subscription. So this cut costs um, and then additional costs were cut through uh, conveyor systems, assembly lines, and press, a better press technology. And so um, around the early 1900s, uh, prices were cut dramatically from 35 cents to 15 cents and then down all the way to 10 cents. This allowed the working class to begin buying magazines and really made it possible for magazines to be a mass medium. In 1905, uh, there were 25 national magazines that published coast to coast, and it really created this idea that Americans were national citizens instead of just regional, because finally there was a communication that could be um, shared across the nation. We also saw a large growth in magazines during this time because there were more drugstores, dime stores, supermarkets, and department stores that were selling magazines. Now the magazines uh, typically sold for less than they cost to make, making them not a great financial investment because if you sell a magazine for 12 cents, but it costs 40 cents to make it, you're gonna be losing money on it. Um, so this is why ad space became particularly important. Um, in the mid 1800s, Harper's Magazine only had seven pages of ads, but by 1900, they had to have 90 pages of ads to make up for the production cost of the magazine. Uh, ads were really meant to capture consumers' attention and it helped build a national marketplace for, one, uh, for the first time, really, um, because you were communicating to all of the nation instead of just regionally. Ladies Home Journal in 1883 was one of the first to recognize that female consumers were going to be a very profitable market. And so uh, by the early 1890s, they had 500,000 in circulation, which was the highest in the country. And in 1903, Ladies Home Journal became the first magazine to reach 1 million in circulation. Now, around this time in the early 1900s, uh, there was a lot, there was a movement in the magazine industry towards social reform and what was called muckraking. Uh, yellow journalism is when a journalist would use uh, social reform on behalf of the public good. So all of their writing was meant to expose wrongs that were happening in society. Um, some of the topics that uh, were discussed through yellow journalism were unregulated patent medicines, so people trying to sell medicine and claiming that they did something when they really didn't, poor living and working conditions uh, for various uh, lower class people, and unsanitary practices in the food industry. 
A lot of the journalists who were writing for magazines during this time were those who didn't like the inverted pyramid style of writing. They wanted more narrative type styles. And so they moved to magazines in order to be able to do more in-depth pieces that allowed for a little more creativity. One of those was Ida Tarbell, who wrote for McClure magazine, and she produced a series of investigative journalism called the History of Standard Oil Company. Uh, Standard Oil Company was owned by John D. Rockefeller, who was one of the business giants in America in uh, the 1900s. And he had started an oil monopoly. And so Ida Tarbell produced a series that took up 19 articles on how Rockefeller's Rockefeller's business practices were actually hurting the American economy by creating this unfair monopoly. And so this is just one example of yellow journalism. In 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt dubbed investigative reporters muckrakers, which is where we get the term muckraking journalist. And it, um, but while President Roosevelt really meant this as a derogatory term, a lot of journalists saw this as a badge of honor because investigative journalists were responsible for paving the way for very important changes in uh, social reform, such as the pure feud and Food and Drug Act, the Meat Inspection Act of 1906, antitrust laws, fair and progressive income taxes, and direct election of U.S. senators. So journalists were responsible for a lot of great changes that happened within our country during this time. Now, the era of muckraking really ended in 1910 when the U.S. entered World War I, because instead of having a watchdog role, the um, field of journalism really needed to unite the nation, which was under war. Now in 1897, uh, Cyrus Curtis bought the Saturday Evening Post and made it the first uh, popular general interest magazine. They produced uh, popular fiction and romanticized American values. Uh, think about Norman Rockwell, if you're familiar with his paintings. He actually produced 322 covers uh, for the Saturday Evening Post. His uh, images really defined a nation during this time. Uh, in the 1920s, the Saturday Evening Post began the first magazine, became the first magazine to hit 2 million in circulation. And um, because of kind of their idealistic uh, romanticizing of American values and, and uh, images, uh, Saturday Evening Post and general interest magazines were really the most prominent from World War I until the mid to late 1950s. One of the key aspects for their success was photojournalism, using pictures to document daily life. It really gave magazines an advantage of the most popular medium during this time, which was radio, because instead of just having to imagine the image, the reader could actually see what was going on. So photojournalism is an important part of magazine culture. Here are some of uh, Norman Rockwell's uh, very well-known uh, covers. I'm smiling just looking at some of these because uh, they just bring back happy memories of an idealistic America. Now we know that this is not what America looked like all the time. In fact, you'll notice that there's not a single person of color um, in any of these photos. It really, but it, it shaped what uh, American values were meant to be at that time for a large population. Now, uh, photojournalism was extremely important for magazines as well. You can see uh, the Migrant Mother picture, which was very well known, or uh, the Kissing Sailor, uh, which showed uh, the end of the war. And so these are moments in our history that were captured through photojournalism that still live on today. And we can see that photojournalism continues to remain an important aspect of journalism as a whole, but the magazine industry as well. Now, general interest magazines, again, were most popular um, during World War 
from World War I to the 1950s, but Reader's Digest uh, was created in 1922. Uh, it condensed articles um, and it made it so that the reading was much shorter. In its early years, it didn't have any advertisements and it was very inexpensive to produce. It was low cost and it even fit in your pocket. Uh, when it was first created. So during the Great Depression, it was an extremely popular publication with over 1 million in circulation. And uh, by 1945, it was the nation's most popular magazine. And by the mid 80s, it was the most popular in the world. Um, right now, it has a readership of about 20 million, uh, 10 to 12 million abroad. Um, but now today there's only a readership of about 3 million. Um, so the 20 million figure was back in the mid 80s. So it's declined very much in readership since then. Time Magazine is also a general interest magazine uh, known for its interpretive journalism and narrative uh, structure, really dealt with a lot of uh, important issues throughout our history. Life Magazine, which was created in 1936, uh, really spoke to the way that Americans were interested in visual communication uh, with images they wrote in the style of radio journalism, and it really made advertising and fashion photography very popular. Um, during its heyday, it had 17 million in readership and uh, something pretty cool to check out if you love uh, photography, Google actually has a life photo archive um, that you can look through all from 1860s uh, to the 1970s and they have some very amazing uh, images that really capture American life. Now, the popularity of a TV guide actually happened in the 1950s and it began to uh, signal the decline in general interest magazines. TV Guide was created in 1953. Its first issue sold 1.5 million copies. And by 1962, it was the first weekly to reach 8 million in circulation. By the late 80s, uh, Murdoch was using it to promote his then new Fox network. Um, and by 2005, it really became a, an entertainment magazine focused solely on television and entertainment industry overall. In 2008, the company was headed for a very large economic decline, and they actually sold it to a venture capitalist for a dollar. That's not a typo. One single dollar it was sold for. But by 2009, that capitalist um, had Lionsgate purchase TV Guide Network and tvguide.com for $255 million. That's a pretty good investment, if you ask me. Now, the reason that um, TV Guide being so popular is important in the overall history of magazine really deals with three key issues going on at the time. First, the rise in specialization. TV Guide spoke to an entertainment interest. Second, it spoke to the growing sales at checkout lines. So people would buy TV Guides as they were grocery shopping or at um, a drugstore, things like that. And that became a fast revenue producer for the magazine industry. And then it also showed that magazines were beginning to suffer at the hands of television. So instead of fighting your enemy, use them to your advantage as TV Guide did. Now, um, a lot of magazines began to fold be during the late 60s and early 70s um, because they were selling at less than production cost and ad revenue began to shift more heavily to TV. Postal rates also increased dramatically during the 70s, which really meant that the typical print publication of magazines just wasn't popular. Now, the survivors of the great decline um, in the 60s and 70s of the magazine industry were women's magazines. Women's magazines, particularly those focused on uh, fashion and glamour, continued to be very popular. People was one of the most successful launches in decades uh, in, within the magazine industry. It began in 1974 and really featured uh, celebrity profiles and human interest stories. 
uh, they, the articles were much shorter than the typical magazine story. In fact, they were about one third shorter than their typical competitor. And they were very image heavy. They also focused on supermarket sales, just like TV Guide did. And today it is uh, one of the first in terms of rad ad revenue and circulation sales where they uh, garner $1.5 billion. Now, with the advent of digital, magazines really saw a shift um, and a refocus of the industry, but not nearly as much as the news and newspaper industry has. Uh, mag the internet offers magazines unlimited space. It also allows for more of an audiovisual experience where magazines are beginning to um, increasingly use social media and video aspects within their reporting. And there's no high paper or mailing costs. So that's really been the biggest uh, help for them. Now, web scenes are those that appear exclusively online. There are also those that offer tablet and magazine apps, such as Entertainment Weekly, Cosmo, Nat Geo, Time, uh, GQ, uh, and Vanity Fair. By 2010, there were 98 iPad apps for magazine, but by 2012, there were over 2,000. So we've seen significant growth in recent years in uh, magazine apps. And uh, because print and digital readership are reported together, it's sometimes hard to piece out who's reading print and who's reading digital. Overall readership for the industry is at about 224 million as of uh, 2018. But 75% of magazine readers say that the apps complement print, while 25% say that the apps have replaced their print magazine. So people still want to read um, a traditional print publication, but they like that they can also get it digitally. So now that we've gone over the primary history of the magazine industry, uh, let's watch uh, the video on the types of uh, industry and specialization models of the magazine business. Then you'll do your discussion on gatekeeping in magazines. Watch our third video on social and democratic issues with magazines. Uh, do a discussion on advertising's effect on magazines. And then you can prepare for week eight by reading chapter four, which will be on popular music.